Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. My name is Elizabeth Rush. I teach in the nonfiction writing program here at Brown University, and I'm here to welcome you to the final event in our 2021 Nonfiction at Now, Nonfiction at Brown reading series. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, the series headliner, Alex Marzano Lesnovich, I have a couple of announcements to make. We wouldn't be here tonight without the generous support of the Marshall Woods Lectureship Foundation, the Swear Center, the English Department, the Shane Family Fund, and Brown Arts Initiative. So we're deeply grateful for all the help that they've given us in hosting these events. Please note that Alex's books are for sale and they're open to signing copies after the reading. They're over there being sold by the fabulous indie bookstore in Providence, 20 Stories. So as a way of introducing Alex's work, I want to just tell you a short story tonight. A few years ago, I traveled the country on a book tour, and in nearly every town where I read, I'd ask the local bookseller to recommend a title. It's a simple gesture, one that helps support indie stores um, and the authors that they keep alive, and it's also a little bit self-serving. I've encountered many phenomenal books this way. I think booksellers are like some of my favorite readers in the world. And I remember to this day, Hans at Milkweed, in Minneapolis, pulling the fact of a body off the shelf. It's stunning, he said. And then he added in a lower register as though haunted, it will change you. It took me a little while to actually start reading the book, but once I did, I couldn't stop. The fact of a body is really difficult to summarize. One part True crime, one part memoir, it runs the story of the murder of a young boy in Louisiana and the multiple trials of his killer alongside the author's struggle for selfhood. Buried in the bedrock of these arcs are questions around sexual violence, justice, and mercy, some of the most difficult subjects to speak of, subjects which language often fails. In this void, in this silence, in this emptiness, the fact of a body takes shape. Throughout this investigation are sentences so lyrical, so rhythmic, that they demand that I read them out loud. Sentences like these. This morning on Barone Street, newspapers blasted black headlines of murder. And later, much later, my mother sings us into the world. Her voice is free, full-throated. We are unknown, we are so tiny, we are just beginning. By writing in this way, Alex coaxes the reader towards the story's deep end, where we can no longer touch bottom, where what we thought we knew no longer offers support. Here, out past the easy realm of the rational, Alex insists that whatever sense we make of the events in the book be ours that we understand as they write towards the book's conclusion, that what you see in Ricky's killing Jeremy depends as much on who you are and the life you've had as what he did. In tonight's introduction, I can really only just scratch the surface of what is so incredibly impressive about that book. Needless to say, the fact of a body has stayed with me ever since I first set it down. It's led me to read no drink Alex's subsequent essays, some of which they are now working on extending into a book length project titled Both and Neither. I understand that Alex will read from some of that project tonight. It's long been a dream of mine to bring Alex to Brown. I'm so pleased that this evening that dream's coming true. So please join me in welcoming Alex Marzano Lesnovich. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Elizabeth. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I was just telling Michael that I think this is my only my second uh, in-person event in like, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> so it is lovely to see um, all your faces or more accurately, more accurately, half of all your faces. Um, 
So thank you, Elizabeth, for having me here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the students, to the students at Nonfiction Now, who I visited with earlier today. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I am working on a book uh, called B Both and Neither. I actually got back last night from a three-month uh, research trip in Europe um, looking in archives um, for histories of transgender folks um, throughout time. And uh, I'm deep in the middle of that book now, but the way that I work through uh, books, I can say this now with the second one, this seems to be my method, um, is that I write like this. I kind of write very non-linearly, and then I amass a huge amount of material, and then, and this is sort of the death knell statement that a teacher once recommended to me, and I was like, I'm never doing that, and now I unfortunately find it the only way I can work. I then retype everything, start to finish, um, pulling from the different excerpts and essays that I've written along the way. So I'm going to read, um, because I've been thinking a lot about like, the fact that we're still in a pandemic, uh, and I don't think we thought that we would be in one this long, <laughs> Um, and I've been sort of thinking about the way that the pandemic um, affects our experiences of ourselves. Um, I know in the U.S. we saw an uptick of people coming out as trans um, during lockdown. And um, because I was just in Europe, I learned that that was true there, too. Um, I've been thinking a lot about identity and the pandemic and also whether you have to write a pandemic into a nonfiction book now. If you are making a nonfiction book right now, like, is there actually any way to have a through line based in this moment that doesn't grapple with what we're living through. Um, I wrote this essay called Futurity um, in the f for the whole first year of the pandemic. It was all I could work on because I couldn't think about much else. Um, and I constantly find myself, found myself working through this. And so um, it's one of those pieces that are making their way into the book, although in changed form, but that I wrote along, along the way, figuring it out. Um, so I'm going to read you that. Um, it should take exactly as long as we have, uh, and then leave time for questions. I hope that, that that is what it does. So if anyone has questions along the way, I'd love to hear them from you after. Um, and that's my favorite part, actually. So conversation, welcome. Um, so like I said, this is called Futurity. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing I need to say. Um, it's in numbered sections, and then there's um, there are sections that have just a dash line. And if you think about a record player, the way a record skips and it hits the same note again, that's what those dashed lines are. So I'm going to say skip, but I don't want you to think about me moving forward. It's more that skip and hitting the same thing again. Okay. One, on a morning early in the second month of the unprecedented time, I rise to the sound of the birds and pad to the kitchen in my slippers. The air smells of hot coffee. Snow blankets the roof just outside the window the light glinting off it, tracing swirls on the wall. I pour the coffee, roasty, familiar, constant. A few weeks ago, I would have carried the cup to my writing desk. There sat a short prayer to the God of creation, pressed my pen to the page, and tried to listen. But now I carry it to my bedroom, where the curtains remain closed. I turn my bedside lamp on and open the novel on my nightstand. I will be in its world, not this one. Two, my jawline has become covered in blonde fuzz, and later, in the bathroom mirror, I see it backlit, the fuzz so pale it is visible only when struck by the light. I turn my head this way, then that, looking. The fuzz wasn't there a month ago. So much has changed. When my agent sent me notes on the latest writing I've been doing, he included an instruction that I must search for mentions of my jawline. You mention the fuzz here and here and here, he says. He means, we get the point. He means, the mentions are getting old. But I have lived all my decades with a smooth jawline. To me, none of this is old. I think of change constantly and the way change implies progression. And now, looking left and looking right, I wonder what I am seeing, what the fuzz is a harbinger of. Will it grow longer? Will I eventually grow a beard? Or will it stay like this, so pale as to be nearly invisible, prepubescent even as time goes forward and inscribes lines on my skin. The future is as unknown to me as the changed world outside my window, the present like a scratch in one of the records my father used to play. Three, at the start of the shelter orders, a lover texted me that, fuck it, while we are all staying at home, they will grow in their shoal patch. 
Shortly after we first met and I told them I was on testosterone, they looked at me in envy. I can't. My levels are already so high. I'll look too much like a man, they said. I'm like you. I don't want to pass. But you, your body takes its time. You get to choose where you land. Four, this lover will come back up, so let's give them a name. Let's call them D. Five, when I wrote that I just met D, what I meant was that we had recognized something in each other on a dance floor, the floor almost empty, the music so loud as to hold all the space of the place, and our bodies had begun a silent communication, me moving this way and that, them coming closer and then further away. This was still, of course, in the before time. Disco lights looped the floor, some colored in ice blue. The beams cast like shadows had been shaped into snowflakes. Watching the swoop of the carved light, I imagined the sheets of colored polyethane that had made it, that cool blue pressed to a burn like fire. The lights chased us and the music grew louder still and I had grimaced or D had grimaced. They said something, but I didn't hear. I shook my head and they came in close then, their mouth suddenly fitted over the shell of my ear. Want to find some quiet? I felt the sound lap in my ear canal, warm. Then the cold slap of outside, the sudden grace of dark, the stars above us so still. They pulled from their pocket a key. The key fitted the lock of their office, which turned out to be across the street. They knew where the security cameras were. The unlocked closet. Afterward, the two of us a little punchy, maybe with drink and maybe with flush, we laughed at the irony of finding ourselves in a closet. We who have located whole lives, whole selves, in the stepping out of closets. There was a small red light in the dark room, and I remember using its dimness as in the dark room, and I remember using its dimness as cover to look at them, really look. The hair, dark enough to be inky, clipped short as bristles. The jaw, square yet soft. Their shoulders, their breasts. They watched me look, the white of their eyes pink in the light, the mirrored black centers. Beads of sweat had formed on their upper lip. Tufts of hair greeted me from their armpits. Their sports bra, two sizes too small, had left angry raw marks across their soft chest. I looked at the hair under their arms and the scores left by the flattening, and they looked at me, and I knew what they were seeing in me, too. Silence stretched into something cinema enough to hold us. For the first time, I thought how alike were the words wrapped, R-A-P-T, and wrapped, W-R-A-P-P-E-D. When they spoke, their voice scratched the edge of tears. I didn't know it would be so healing, they said. I've never been with someone else who... I don't think I let them finish, my mouth over theirs. Six, an incomplete list of things I have heard called queer about this pandemic. The surge in people making their own sourdough starter out of nothing more than flour and water and time. The rise in mask for mask jokes. Or what does a lesbian bring to a second date? No, not a U-Haul, a COVID test. Or U-Hauling as a responsible public health move. Cuffing season, sex pods. The New York City Public Health Department recommending people, quote, make it a little kinky with glory holes. The rise in OnlyFans and Findom, which is to say the rise in sex work. Thirst traps, sexting, phone sex, Zoom sex, FaceTime sex, sleeping with your roommates. Spending the holidays with chosen family. The very fact of a pandemic. Loss, grief, the impossibility of imagining a future. Seven, futurity, noun. Yes, all right, future time, the sense that there will be a future. The very thing that we are all trying to hold on to as we wait for it to arrive. The projected shape that future makes. The shadow or light it casts over the present. But also, futurity, noun. A race for two-year-old horses into which they are entered before they are born. Eight. And all right, as a metaphor for gender, maybe that's a little obvious. But also, futurity is offer some of the richest prizes in horse racing. Nine. From the windows of my study, I can see the largest hospital in Maine. By law, the ambulances must turn off their sirens this close. And so periodically, when I look up from my desk now, two months into the at-home time, I see silent flashing lights. 
After a few days of this constant screaming silent alarm and of the helicopters that land on the hospital roof at all hours, their thrums so loud as to consume me in the beat of metal wings, I write a prayer with a blue sharpie onto a purple index card and thumbtack it to the wall between two windows, right in my line of sight. May they be safe. May they be happy. May they be healthy. May they live with ease. 10. When we learn that men are dying at an exponentially higher rate than women from this virus, a friend asks me if I'll keep taking testosterone. I mutter something about how, well, I'm not going to go off a drug without medical advice, and my doctor has other things on her mind right now. That answer, I know, is bullshit. One of the purported benefits of the daily gel I use versus a weekly shot is that its progress is slow, and each day I must choose to apply it, must reaffirm my choice of who I am, of who I am transforming to visibly be. I could choose no. What I really mean, but don't say, is that men have shorter life expectancies, more heart attacks, higher rates of dementia, and that I already knew all that. The trade-off did occur to me. But I do ask the doctor if I will lose my hair. That's what Rogaine's for, she says. It's not a reason not to live your life. Obviously, I want to live my life. I just like to live it with hair. 11. Here is how researchers say we slot one another into genders with a glance. The shape of a hairline, the shape of the eye socket, the ratio of hip to waist, the shape of the jawline, the shape of the chest. Clothing, hair length, manner of standing, where fat is distributed, quickness to smile. You can tell by the nose, the title of a 1995 study. We look for patterns. We look for what we know how to see. And I get that with bodily factors, I'm talking about sex, not gender. But what I'm really speaking of is how people perceive. The slotting, the conflation that happens the instant they perceive. That instant is what I keep thinking about. Just an instant, but in it a whole narrative. My life unfurls. 12. Imagine the horse's owner perusing the, the pages of racing magazines loading websites late at night in an office tucked in beside the tack room and a stable, the smell of sweat and dirt thick over the printouts of lineages that litter the desk. Perhaps there is a cup of coffee beside them. Perhaps a pregnant mare whinnies from down a long line of stalls, pacing before settling into her bed of hay. The owner sips from the coffee, clicks the mouse to scroll down the page, searches the list of races in several years' time. You have pictured the owner either male or female, which doesn't matter. The owner is not the one we care about here, but which? Shadows pool around the blue light of the laptop. At the foal's birth, then regularly thereafter, there will be fees to pay for each race in anticipation of when the horse will be ready. There must be a budget, calendars to be planned, a choice of projections in which to invest, the mapping out of finances and a life. 13. Imagine, too, that equine fetus, long limbs folded beneath it, not yet ready to run, tiny hooves still soft and shredded, not yet hardened by the pounding of movement, how now it rests and grows curled in the warm, wet womb for 11 months. The owner clicks and sips and allots money and decides which racing ovals will inscribe its future path, where bets will be placed, where its hardened hooves will someday run. I have a twin brother. We had a triplet sister, a sister in chromosomes at least. She would die too young for any of us to know anything about her. So here is what little we knew. The blue eyes of a baby, tiny like, tiny like us, and like us, premature. Girl. One of each, and me. Two girls and a boy, the birth announcement. At eight, I became aware I wasn't a girl. Fourteen. One of the first known people to use testosterone to alter his body was British 24-year-old Michael Dillon in 1939. He'd sought the treatment nominally for his menstrual periods, but already wore the clothing of a man. Before Dillon, men had grafted slices of chimpanzee testicles to their own. They had attached snippets taken from the genitals of goats. They had had the tubes that carried sperm from the testicles blocked in the hopes that stopping its movement would create a surplus of vigor. Even William Butler Yeats underwent that surgery, hoping to keep up with a younger lover. 
Freud too, and he demanded the doctor not disclose that until his death. Dylan simply took pills. In writer Pagan Kennedy's account of his transformation, it is one way and absolute, and the hormone is what achieves and legitimizes it, upholding the sanctity of the binary. Of Dylan before he was Michael, Kennedy writes, she became the first woman on record to take the drug with the intention of changing her sex. A sentence elapses, only a sentence. As soon as Dylan could look entirely male, he became invisible. 15. My writing seems to come out these days like my thoughts do, in snippets, disconnected, seized up. The thoughts don't, can't adhere. I try to make a narrative line, but only these dots appear. Even Dee and I don't see each other anymore. I'm alone in my apartment, no one to witness me or me them. We are all social distancing from one another. 16. We need a sense of what you want your body to look like, my agent writes. You tell us what feels wrong, what you want to change, but you don't tell us what you want to change to. He is asking me to imagine what comes after. 17. Levels, levels of testosterone for those assigned female at birth generally stop at 60 or 70 nanograms per deciliter of blood. Levels for those assigned male at birth generally begin at 270 or 280 or 300. Note the vastness of the unnamed middle. When I began taking testosterone, my own levels fell very clearly on one side of the divide. Now I am caught in that middle, a sentence without knowledge of its end. 18. At times, I try to imagine what I want this country to look like when all this is over. I try to imagine us taking care of one another. I try to imagine my relatives and neighbors not reacting to the virus as though it is political. I try to imagine 343,593, today's count, at least when I wrote this, um, tomorrow it will be higher, people not dead, so many of them black and brown, and so many of them economically marginalized. While I'm at it, I try to imagine black men and women not killed by the police, immigrants not hunted at the border, a nation not founded on genocide, the erasure of the violences that make this place. 19. And okay, I try to imagine what I want to look like, but I grew up in the same damn binary everyone else did. The same damn America. 20. The truth is, I don't know how to answer my agent. It is easier for me to say what I don't want. Harder for me to say what I do. 21. Queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. The future is queerness's domain, writes Jose Esteban Munez. 22. There was a year once when I pricked myself 144 times with needles. I had known that my body could not cradle a baby, historically a mark of womanhood, but my body has always been made to fail that part, that to do so might endanger my life. I had assumed that there would be some future solution to this. Maybe a partner would carry, maybe science would catch up. A bit of regression as to how I soothed myself to sleep when I was a child. No need to be afraid of death, for science would surely solve it before I got, grew old. My belief in science more potent than in any magic, any dream, any god. But I had aged, and the future had arrived, and there was no solution beyond pulling forth what was inside this body, my body. And so I went to doctors and had a probe inserted in myself, and I saw my own insides on the screen and the nascent beginnings of the material that could go into making another person. Every morning and every night, I drew clear liquid into a syringe and injected it into the ring of fat around my belly button, moving the needle clockwise to a new site, mimicking the march of time. My abdomen puffed. I grew nauseated, which seemed only fair. If my child would come into the world without me ever having morning sickness, shouldn't I be paying that debt forward now? 23. After each shot, I ate a, super, a cracker spread with the cheapest caviar, the kind you can get at the supermarket for $6 a jar. I had begun the ritual as a joke. I need to find joy and inject levity into the process. 
I need to disrupt how medicalized the whole thing was, how sterile, all these foreign objects I used to break my skin. We were trying to coax my body into such a high estrogen level that it would release more eggs than the usual monthly one. I would, therefore, eat tiny eggs. Rhyming action, a move familiar to any writer. But what began as a joke was soon overcome by sensation. The smoothness of the hard little eggs between my palate and tongue, the salty pop as intense as the sea. The joke became a prayer, the taste as much benediction as tears. 24. The drug I injected myself with arrived by manila envelope from Israel, ordered off a spare website with a sketchy, straightforward name, 1-800-IVF-MEDS. In the United States, my dose might have cost me $1,000 every two days. From the website, more than a week could be had for that amount. The drug was precious, befitting its fairy tale origins. Synthesized now, but once distilled from the urine of elderly cloistered Italian nuns. At their age, they had too much of the hormone needed to be pregnant. How infertility works. Too much, not too little. That too muchness could be harvested, the wealth spread. So why nuns? Because the nuns had, presumably, not had sex, because they had, presumably, not seen their body reflected back in the body of the nether, because, presumably, there was no chance they could be pregnant. 25. Only writing this do I realize that my gay self would have been as safe a bet as those Italian nuns. Pretty funny. 26. One morning in the middle of the year of injections, I went to the doctor for a monitoring appointment. I did this a couple of times a week each cycle and had long since asked to insert the probe myself. A small bit of agency claimed. On the screen, black fuzz resolved itself into the shape of the follicles inside me the space is growing larger to shelter eggs. That afternoon, for a class I was taking, I went to a laboratory as sterile and white as the exam room I'd left. There, five dead bodies were laid out on slabs. Two men, three women. I put on a plastic butcher's apron and clear plastic goggles and nitrile gloves, and my partner handed me a scalpel and pointed. I brought the blade to the body's fallopian tube. That's not quite right. I don't want to say the body, not doing something as intimate as slicing her up. But there, there you see the problem again, her. I know nothing of this person, only the shape of their body. From this, I have deduced a pattern. I have no other word to choose. I don't know who she was beyond the mark of those ovaries. With my scalpel, I split them open, pale pink and the size of green cocktail olives. I saw the tiny hard eggs within, larger than a pinprick, a pencil point, the period of a sentence. Futures that had never been. 27. The drug worked. My body released eggs. Never many, but enough. These were injected with sperm, grown for several days, and then frozen. The cycle repeated once, twice, three times again. 28. Still, I waited. That fertilization had happened was no proof life could ever take root. It seemed likely I would be told it was all for naught, that the child I had wanted since I was a child was not possible. It seemed impossible that I would get anything I wanted that much, as though the very act of wanting would make it impossible. Does everyone carry such felt knowledge of doom inside them, such belief in the impossibility of a future? Or only those of us born into bodies that cast us into a narrative that doesn't fit? as though having the audacity to want and to act on that want would itself be a trick, the coin proffered by a magician that vanishes with the opening of the hand that ought to reveal it. 29. So I remember the whoosh in my chest when, over the phone at the end of the year, I was finally told that some, five, of the embryos were viable. How in that instant, a path opened to a door that opened to a future. 30. Maybe I only ever write about the problem of how to believe in the future. 31. I was ready to hang up then. I remember that, too. I was awash in glee, as though all at once the blood of my body had been rinsed in relief. The sensation was overwhelming, light-flooded, alive. I wanted to get off the phone, get away from the doctor's voice, and just feel. 32. But she kept on. Of the five, there's, she said, 
and told me the sex of the embryos. How many this kind? How many that? A clear favorite, not even odds, not at all. 33. The child in my daydreams acquired a gender. Skip. When I emerged from the restaurant where I'd taken the call, there was a child standing on the street, gripping a mother's hand. The mother, irrelevant to me, never what I would be. But that child, short blonde hair, striped shirt, a smudge on its cheek. It appeared to be of the gender that matched the sex I had just been told my someday child would likely be, and I remember how closely I observed it. I remember the feel of a daydream arranging itself, as though it were straightening its shirt hem, spitting into its palm, patting down its hair. Skip. And sure, I do my best to note in my daydreams now that a child's gender is not known just because their chromosomes are. Of that, I myself am proof. And really, even those chromosomes may turn out to be more complex as each embryo grows more than the 70 to 100 cells it has now. I know enough about sexology to know that the simplicity we've been bottle-fed is a lie, always has been a lie, that there are far more than two options, and that they are not as set as we might imagine. I do my best to imagine a doctor informing me of complexity. I do my best to imagine a child coming to me the way I eventually did to my parents. I do my best to imagine them speaking a truth about who they are, and it not being the truth I expected. Or... Conversely, the queer version of the unimaginable future. I do my best to think that perhaps they will be the most gender-conforming kid around, and I'll have to wrap my mind around that. I do my best to hold space for every possibility. Skip. But I still can't imagine child without imagining gender. Skip. And what is a dream if not a narrative? Skip. And what is a narrative if not constant foreclosure? this instead of that. Skip. What is the future if not the thing that replaces all other possible worlds? 34. Nine months into the pandemic, the gestation of a body, I decide to switch from the testosterone gel to the shot. The gel is inconvenient, sticky. Often it runs in rivulets down my shoulders. And I no longer need to make this decision daily. If ever I did, I know it's the right one but also I am getting impatient. So one afternoon, I sit in my study, alone in front of the computer. On the screen, my doctor appears from an ivory voice office where she also is alone. Yes, she says, it's likely my body will respond to the shot more quickly. The term she uses is masculinize. 35. I may pass as a man someday, but I will know in my gut that I had to convince myself that I was allowed to have that passing writes Cyrus Grace Dunham. And maybe I will always wonder if that passing is just a trick, a lie. 36, and I do want to change, but I don't want to pass. Not as a woman, not as a man. I go back so often to that moment with Dee on the dance floor when our bodies recognized each other, when in the closet we looked and we saw. I've never been with someone else who... I kissed them then because I wanted to kiss them, but also because what they were saying, what they meant, was so true I couldn't bear to hear it said. I knew what they meant because I felt it too. Someone else who. Someone else who exists in the in-between. Someone else who, with my body, could make them feel seen in theirs. 37. So what did we see that lay beyond sight? 38. Dee wasn't quite right those months ago when they envied me for getting to choose where I land on a gender spectrum. The effects of testosterone are cumulative. For as long as I use it, I will, to use the doctor's parlance, masculinize myself. Were I to stop entirely, some effects would remain. The thickened vocal cords and thereby, still only slightly, deepened voice. The spread of bodily hair that has now overtaken my legs. The enlarged clitoris called bottom growth. Others would recede increased libido, increased tendency towards muscle. To take a smaller dose, as I do, is to just bring on these effects more slowly. Whatever time has felt like during this pandemic, there is no actual way to stand still. 39. Except, perhaps, for the embryos. They exist in a suspended state, frozen at negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature at which biological progression pauses. I like that neat countdown. Three, two, one. 
40. I suppose I like the way numbers imply order. 41. After all, narrative is order. 42. After all, don't we always live anticipating the next step? 43. For a while, the embryos were kept mere miles from where I lived. Passing by them on the highway, I would lift my left hand off the wheel to wave at the gray building, as nondescript as any warehouse. But I moved, and that warehouse was expensive, and now they are hundreds of miles away in a town, in a county, in a state I've never seen. 44. I think of them often. I try to visit the future. 45. I had decided I would do the first shot the evening of my birthday. Why not begin a new year with this becoming? And a practical reason. I had been warned that the hormone would likely hit all at once, 12 hours or so later, and so to do it earlier in the day might disrupt my sleep with desire. I have grown accustomed to these awakenings. To say I don't mind them would be an understatement. What a gift, how amazing, how alive, in the midst of a time of stalemate, to ceaselessly want. But still, the need for rest. 46. When I finally did the shot that evening, it was, no way around this, no big deal. I pulled the liquid into the syringe, less than a centimeter's worth. I twisted off the needle and replaced it with a finer one. It is not hard for me to find fat, for in this way, too, pandemic time has been working its way in my body. Most days, this new curviness, gendered as it feels, is hard for me, but it makes injection easier. I pressed the needle's point against my skin, and I winced at the bit of pain. I inhaled. I pushed. The 145th shot towards a future I want. 47. I suspect I had more pain than this once. I suspect I had less certainty. 48. The future is not yet here. Last week marked one year since the night on the dance floor. Nine months have passed since we all began staying home. When I pulled on my winter coat yesterday morning, I was startled to discover a bottle of hand sanitizer already in it, the mark of time's loop. Oh yes, we have been here a while. Oh yes, for a while, here we will stay. 49. When I pass the small mirror I keep by the door, I see my reflection. A little more of that blonde fuzz on my jawline. My skin texture a little coarser. To me, my nose looks the same, but who sees change when they watch for it every day? 50. And I wonder each time if it is ever possible to break free from time. If and when and how the future becomes the now. Thank you. If anyone's got questions, I would love to chat. Yeah, that's a great question, how it differentiates. Um, I have no idea. It's a guttural impulse that ends up with a structure. <laughs> um, Maggie Nelson's Bluets is probably one of my favorite books, and um, I was very cognizant reading that, that what the numbers were doing for me, which is like it's this fragmentary memoir, um, but there's no real sense of time progression in it. Um, it's interwoven research and memoir, but you notice at the end that you feel rather satisfied that there has been progression, in part because the numbered sections have added up. And she does this thing uh, shortly before the end of Bluets where she has her, she's like sitting on the floor surrounded by index cards that are all the different fragments and she's just putting them in order and you're suddenly like, oh, that's what the numbers I was reading were. Um, <laughs> so I think that there's a way in which I know when I'm reading, I like to be assured that there's some kind of progression going on. And so here they felt honest because it felt like, okay, well, the numbers on the calendar, something's going forward. The numbers on the calendar are still going forward in this strange pandemic time, but time has definitely changed. Um, in terms of where I broke them, like why I broke them the way they did, I don't honestly know. I can tell you that it's something I feel when I'm writing and revising. Like I, I feel like I can feel the beats uh, to put it in like an actor's term in a scene, like you feel the emotional beats in the scene, the little components of it. Um, but I wouldn't be able to say why it feels to me like one belongs where and the next belongs in the next. Um, I care a lot about rhythm 
but I never find the rhythm until I read stuff out loud and I, I talk to myself when I'm writing and that's often how I find it. Makes me annoying at coffee shops though. I'm just like mumbling. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Of course, now is really lovely. I think we're off this. Um, I was wondering, like, Obviously, both that piece and um, that body dealt with like very personal aspects of your life, but also like, very different aspects. Um, I'm like, I was wondering, like, what was it like, sort of like writing that piece specifically after you wrote about your body, and like, what writing that like to such different but still like intimate personal like experiences and stuff. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, uh, two things. One, I would say that writing. You would never know this from reading my work, maybe, but writing personal material makes me absolutely nauseous. Um, and yet I keep doing it. <laughs> um, I think there's stuff I'm trying to like figure out that I can only figure out with respect to looking at the world around me and research and then coming back to the personal and then going back outward again. It's like I'm trying to figure out something about the world, about how we understand gender, and that brings me back to my life. Or I'm trying to figure out something about my life, and that brings me out to the world. Um, in terms of how it felt to write this after that, I think I'm more used to the idea now that I'm that the piece might take me somewhere I didn't know it was going. So um, that book certainly took me to write about things I didn't know I was going to write about, and probably wouldn't have written like I wouldn't have chosen to write about it at the start, but felt very necessary. And the book sort of taught me how to write it, where I was I was ready to go to those places once I was at that point of the writing. Um, this piece. Um, the IVF wasn't in it at all. I've never written about that. I never really thought I would talk about that or about like the desire for a child or like how that intersects with like thinking about gender. Now I'm like, how did I think I was going to write about testosterone and not write about that? Like, <laughs> those are two pretty parallel things when you talk about giving yourself shots to in hormones. Um, so in that similar way, and I think I'm more prepared now to say, okay. I assume that my subconscious is letting me start this piece in a safe way where I think it's just about this thing over here. Don't look over there. Don't look at the monster in the closet, right? Um, but that by the time I write a draft out, my subconscious will take me to this other place. And I think I've made more peace with that. It's still scary sometimes, but I've made more peace with that. Yeah? Yeah, I think this is actually kind of the only thing that I'm really doing with that. Um, while well, you were just answering that previous question, I was thinking a lot about how the way in which writing about the self is often recognized in a very different way. You can think about the history of Europe, or you think about who was this was during the age of the Vietnam, this idea of like this inherently gendered experience of writing on the internet. I'm interested in your experience as writing about the self and how maybe that has. Uh, been shaped by your experiences, considering your gender. I don't know if that makes sense or if that it absolutely does. Um, I, I and it's very cultural. Right? So like I did a lot of events for the fact of a body where I was paired with um, cis men memoirs, cis male memoirs. They got asked almost uniformly I got asked no questions on tour in the US about the death penalty or the legal system with respect to the fact of a body. All questions are personal. They almost always got questions about craft, how they wrote the book, or um, the sociopolitical content of the book, almost uniformly, and never about themselves. Um, and then when I was doing event, I did a lot of events in France for the book, almost uniformly, no questions about my selfhood. Um, that was seen as invasive. All questions about what was up with the American judicial system, um, which I was very prepared to talk about. I was like, thank you. <laughs> um, and so I think it's very, it's, it's quite cultural. Um, I don't know whether it affects my own writing about myself. I'm sure it does. Like, I'm sure there's a way in which, given how I was like socialized female, um, I'm probably more prepared to like go to those emotional places in some ways. But I think also I feel politically um, upset about that reading and I feel politically energized by it where I'm, I think I'm always, and maybe, maybe there's something gendered, I've never thought about this, but thank you for this question. Maybe there's something gendered about the way that like I am not happy writing strictly memoir and I'm not happy writing strictly journalism that everything I write tends to be a freaking mashup which is like a theme in my life. Um, 
I don't know. I'm going to think about that a lot. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. How do you kind of figure out what starts with the personal life? Are you Great question. It's a mess. Um, <laughs> lots of drafting, um, lots of cutting. Um, I would say I'm usually bored by it first. That in general, if it's something that's going to bore the reader, some part of me knows it's boring. I'm boring myself, and um, I have to pay attention to that. Um, and half half the battle for me, I feel like, is learning to pay attention to those uneasy feelings. Because often, I don't know if this is relatable to others, but often when I'm sitting down to revise, like, I know it doesn't work, but like, I don't know how to fix it. So like, maybe if I just pretend it works. Um, and so part of it is just like, being brave enough to like, listen to that, that queasiness. Um, and figuring out why it's still interesting to me. But off, usually if it's going to be boring, I, know, I, I secretly know it's boring. Um, and I just haven't found, what's, I haven't found what's interesting about it yet. Um, I will say it's interesting to me now. Like I've realized I have to write childhood scenes in the book I'm working on now. And it's interesting that I... It's inter I'm having to go back into my childhood with like a different lens. If there was one lens that was about like trauma and story making, now the lens on the same scenes, in some cases the same scenes with my brother, like longer versions of the same scenes, have to be gender. Um, and so it's, it's sort of re-asking myself, okay, if you look at it through this angle, what do you see? If you look at it through this angle, what do you see? If you look at this, this angle, what do you see? And that can be a way to maybe keep it fresh. But in general, if it's boring me, I, I put it aside and work on something else <laughs> until it's interesting to me again. It was on my mind as a thing I could never reveal. I, I had no plans to ever come out. Um, I didn't actually come out until I was on book tour for The Fact of the Body. And all of a sudden, I was like speaking publicly about something that had been such a big secret. And it was almost impossible to hold the other big secret. And I was just like, why am I doing this? Like, why am I still doing this? Um, so I don't know that it came up on the page so much as it came up for me as like, a, don't go there, um, don't tell that story. Um, it was also a different time in publishing. Publishing has changed really quickly. And so when I was initially, the, the earliest editors who saw the fact of a body, uh, or actually I'll just quote my first agent who said I could put in here if, um, I could sell this if it was just about trauma, I could sell this if it was just a memoir, but how could you put the child abuse, or I could tell us if it was just about the murder, um, how could it be about those two things and, and you be queer in it, who do you think is going to read this book? Um, obviously that was not the right agent for me, <laughs> found another agent promptly, um, but you know, it was a different time in terms of, the year that that came out um, was the first time that there were any uh, memoirs by assigned female at birth queer people um, put out by the major publishing houses in the US. Um, and there were three. And that was only 2017. So things have changed really quickly. Um, and so I think I had a sense of, I really want this kid, meaning kid Alex's like story out there. I really want Langley's story out there. And I can't tell everything. You know, This book can only be about a certain number of things. Um, so it came up that way. And maybe it shouldn't have, like maybe, uh, maybe a story. I go back and forth on this about whether like maybe I should have been able to write more of it, more, maybe I should have been able to tell more. But on the other hand, it was so scary. It was like, I'm willing to write you this story of my life, but I'm not willing to write this other part yet. Um, yeah. I'm <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'm in, often in different places when I write different sections of a piece. Like, my voice um, has recalibrated or changed slightly. So certainly with like this project now, like I know my own experience of myself um, shifted a little bit during the pandemic. I, I think a lot of people had experiences where their knowledge of themselves was shifting. And my voice on the page has changed a little. And so the parts where I've drafted differently across time, they actually don't they, they fit together, but they don't feel a piece. And I feel like the fiction of a narrator is that the narrator stands in one place in one moment in time and delivers the full breadth of the work. Like the narrator is always talking to you from one moment in time where they've digested everything, but I'm not that person until I've actually digested everything. <laughs> like I just can't find that voice. And so for certain, certainly with the fact of a body, it took me the entirety of writing the book to find the right voice for the book. Um, that book took me many years to write, but the but half of it was written in the last year before I turned it in, um, because it took that long to like hone in on the right voice. But I'm kind of a lazy reviser, and so if I were just revising off the text, I wouldn't make a ton of changes. I, I feel like I would pretty it up but I like wouldn't have the courage to like jettison whole things, you know? Um, Dinti Moore likes to say that people think revision is uh, walking into the living room and propping up, plumping up the couch cushions and like tidying up the curtains and dusting the table. But he says re revision really is walking into the living room, clearing all the furniture out, standing in what is suddenly an empty space and asking yourself, what does this room really want to be? <laughs> and so I just can't do that unless I'm retyping. But if I'm retyping, then all of a sudden my gut's like, why are you typing that paragraph? You know that paragraph sucks. Um, and so my laziness works for me instead of against me. That's why. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for having me.